Thank you. John always does such a wonderful job of picking music that goes with the scripture. And the scripture today is from Mark chapter 6, verses 30 to 34 and 53 to 56. What makes that selection that the choir sang so beautifully so appropriate is that the writer of the Gospel of Mark is writing about Jesus, but he's doing it in such a way to emphasize both the total humanity of Jesus as well as his divinity. On the one hand, you see the divinity of Jesus because as I read, you'll find out about Jesus healing and all of the, the miracles that Jesus does. But at the same time that he's being divine and miraculous, he's totally human because the writer of Mark recognizes that Jesus is exhausted and needs to get away. With that in mind, listen once again for God's word. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a deserted place by themselves. But now many saw them going and recognized him and they hurried on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of him. And as he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Genesaret and moored the boat. And when they got out of the boat, people once, at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into the villages, or cities, or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we can only imagine the expectations that were placed on Jesus. Desperate people needing desperate answers. And Jesus had it. He had so much ability, he could do so much, but he was still, yep, just one person. And we know what that feels like, to be pulled in so many directions, to be frustrated because there is so much yet to be done. And we pray that in this moment we will learn from Jesus and figure out how we can live our lives with meaning and yet still have something left to give. We ask for your care this day through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I think the idea of food trucks is great. I bet they're wonderful. I haven't gone over downtown to check out the food trucks yet, but I'm ready and raring. The only thing that worries me about food truck, trucks is that you get the people coming down from the principal building and this building and that building and they're ready. And where they might have gone out real fast and actually sat down, now they're running out to the food trucks, grabbing their food, running back up to their desk and working while they eat. And there are so many people that work through their lunch. They never stop long enough to rest Teens that are on the way, they'll rush out the door because they were up late last night re reading, getting their work together, getting their practices in. And so all they have time, they sleep an extra 15 minutes so that all they have time for in the morning is to shower and grab a bagel and run out the door. That isn't anything like you guys, is it? Yeah, I see the smile. Parents and children that drive through fast food because they don't have time for anything between school being out, work getting off, and getting to Wednesday night here because it's too late to even get them here in time for food. Or what they're doing was between soccer practices and lessons and rehearsals and everything else they're doing, they're going basically crazy trying to do it all. Families that can't remember the last time they ate dinner around the table together with the television off. Now, I'm preaching, so do as I say and not as I do. <laughs> Although it's a whole lot easier when your kids are grown and they're out of the house. 
You find the kit, you find the dining room table again once in a while. But I feel for people. We only had one child, and she was a pain. I can't imagine having three or four. <laughs> Good Lord. I don't remember the last time I was really caught up. I feel like I've been behind since maybe the end of eighth grade. And I don't think I'm ever going to relax, even on vacation, until the second year of my retirement. It just, and I hope even then I can actually slow my, my brain down. It's just so silly. Why can't we? But as ministers, and I, I can only speak as a minister because that's all I've been. I worked at Hardee's and I was a minister. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but I read in an article not long ago that 10% of a congregation is in crisis at any given moment. That means that Ken and I have a responsibility for about 110 to 140 people every day. And we can't get to everybody. And it frustrates us. I'll go into his office and I'll bang on his desk. Because you can do that with Ken. He's calm. <laughs> Ken can't do that to me. I'll be bouncing off the walls. <laughs> and we'll be, it's like spiritual triage sometimes. And I'm sure in whatever you're doing, it feels like the same thing. You just bounce from one thing to another. You don't have time. You don't think. You just do. And you get through the day and you don't even remember what you did. And I know I'm not alone. Many of you are strung out, adrenaline addicted, just like I am. But you don't have to feel that guilty. Because you aren't alone. We have each other in our, in our problems. And Jesus, thankfully, was in the same boat we are. All he wanted to do was get those apostles away. He just wanted to take them to a different shore where they could be lo alone long enough to say, how's your ministry going? What did you do? Where are you in all of this? And they just kept following him. Hannah was home overnight this weekend, but I had a wedding. I had phone calls to take. I had things to do. I'm sneaking out of here pretty fast after the service because she's coming back through town with her boyfriend and we're going to sneak out for a Chinese lunch. Maybe. It's just crazy. We're all just desperate people flying from one thing or another. Do you ever feel like everyone else controls your life but you? Because this person calls, your boss calls, your neighbor needs something. Your, your spouse or your kids or somebody, and all you're doing is bouncing around like a ball in a pinball machine from one thing to the next. And there's no time for compassion. I'm all impressed that Jesus took the time to stop and heal all these people when he was that tired. But sometimes your heart isn't even in it. You don't even feel like it. Maybe Jesus just walked along. I always wondered why even touching the cloak of his garment was so important. Maybe because he was just walking along like this and all they were going to get from him was touching his robe because he was too tired to lift his arms. But it worked. And so when you're really feeling beat up, maybe it's working even when you don't feel like it. I swear, 90% of parenting is the celebration that your children are still alive today. <laughs> and that can be enough some days. It's the fact that you're still moving forward and doing something. And I know most of you who your children are gone, you're like, wow, they turned out pretty well in spite of us. And that's because most of the time you felt so strung out, you don't even remember half of it sometimes. And that's all right. But somewhere along the line, we have to figure out how to move beyond being walking zombies and actually doing something and taking our lives back so that we're good for something besides just responding to everyone else's needs. We all know the desperation. 
I read an article one time about after Katrina happened in 2005 and why the government didn't respond quickly enough, why other organizations were not, or even it took months even to organize a lot of charitable work. And after the fact, when they look back on it, they realized that no one wanted to deal with it. And the quote was, because the desperation was too close. It's one thing to give to El Salvador. It's another thing to give to the Congo. It's another thing to give to some far off place where there are always problems and we can always accept it. But this was in the United States of America in the new millennium. It could have been us. And we didn't want to face it. That level of desperation, we didn't want to look at. So we ignored it. And it took so long to care for them. My brother was in the 1994 flood in Grand Forks, North Dakota. I talked to somebody at the wedding reception last night that was also there. They were in the Air Force, so they were off sandbagging somewhere else when the water took out their home and they were left with nothing. That sense of desperation is so overwhelming that you have nothing left to give anybody else when you've lost everything. Compassion is hard to come by. And yet Jesus had it enough to stop. He didn't got back in the boat, run away from the crowd. He didn't have a lot to give. I really think he was dragging, but he still gave whatever was left inside of him to at least let them touch him. And I think in that moment, that's what made Jesus more than just a prophet and allowed them to recognize that he was divine. Because all the other divinity, divinities of all the other pagan gods were ominous, frightening, removed, without compassion. And yet Jesus gave it over and over again. Now I read this somewhere, I don't speak German, don't claim to speak German, don't know German, so I'll blame the author if this is wrong. But in German, in the German language, the word compassion means to suffer with. And a lot of people confuse compassion with pity. You can pity someone and do it removed or at a distance. But if you have compassion, that's something very different. Compassion means that you suffer with them, that you're in anguish with them. You hurt with them. Jesus couldn't get back in the boat. He couldn't turn away because he felt their agony and he couldn't do anything else but be there. That's the great joy. We argue a lot and we're fighting all the time, Christians with, with the people of Israel, with the Islamic people. The one thing all three of these monotheistic re religions have in common besides one God is compassion. And when we bastardize our religion, and Jewish people do it, Christians do it, and Muslims do it, by extremism, but when we are at the heart of our three religions, the one thing we can share and we need to emphasize more is compassion. Hospitality are key words within all three religions. So we need to find the time Carve out the time. Figure out how to make it work just a little bit more so that we have something left to give others. When I was young, when I was in high school, we had a, my grandmother had a summer place, so we'd stay there in Minnesota. And you'd sit there on a nice day, sit in the bottom of the boat, lie there and look at the sky, and a summer afternoon would go on forever. Remember it? You could almost be bored. Then you get busy with life and days go fast. Then you, if you have children, you end up getting to high school with them and then days go really fast. Then they're out of the house, they go even faster. Do not talk to anyone that's retired because they will tell you it goes even faster and you'll be so scared you don't even want to face it. 
The one thing I've never heard a person who's retired say that time slowed down. It picks up, it goes. Time is a commodity. And we don't treat it with respect. Time is something we need to treat with respect because it is a more valuable commodity than money. How, what you do with the time you have. And so, we need to plan and organize ourselves in such a way that we have that little extra moment to be alone when we need it, and we have that little extra time to give back when there's the moment and the opportunity to do it. Schedule your life. Trust in God. But the one thing I want to make very clear is God will sustain you when you do not have anything left. In that moment when you're dragging, Jesus knows what you're feeling. And when all you have the energy to do is walk with like this, and they're grabbing onto your cloak, God will sustain you till tomorrow and give you enough energy to get through tomorrow and the day after that and move you forward. Don't beat yourself up one minute longer because you're not energetic enough. You're not this enough. You're not that enough. You're enough for God. 90% of life is showing up and you aren't going to ruin anybody. Your children will thrive in spite of us. And you will make it because God will give you what you need for today, tomorrow, and into that fast-paced future. Trust, pray, believe, and hold firm to God's promise now and always. Amen.